Hello folks and welcome back to English 437-537 with me, Dr. Barton. Uh, in this lecture we'll be covering uh, the chapters about being the media from Amy Jo Martin and then we'll get into the first part of the editing chapters in the Carol books. A lot of good material here. Hope you are enjoying these readings. A lot of very useful practical information and it's also very motivating I think. So hope you're enjoying these selections. Uh, for the first question, uh, I want you to take a few minutes since uh, Amy Jo Martin, she talks so much about Shaq or Shaquille, his uh, Twitter feed and the role social media has played and continues to play in his career. Uh, uh, so take a minute, take a look at this link here. I'll post it in the, in the question so you can just click on it. But go to Shaq's uh, Twitter feed, have a look at it, scroll up and down, uh, see what he's tweeting himself, what he's retweeting. And... Uh, I want you to kind of pretend, maybe you have followed Shaq or know a lot about him, but just kind of put that aside for this question. And instead, imagine if you're just kind of looking at this, trying to get a sense of who is this guy? Is this a real account? Uh, does his personality come through? Uh, what kind of impression do you get, basically? And then take a look at the tweets and, and ask yourself if they seem like they're written by a human, first and foremost, not a bot. Uh, do they seem authentic? Is there an emotional engagement there? Does it seem genuine? Uh, or does it come across as fake or insincere, pandering, you know, what we might call as like a heavy corporate style? <laughs> and then uh, what about the content of the tweets? Is it just about him sort of bragging about stuff, pointing out stuff that he's working on or products he's trying to sell? Uh, or does there seem to be some genuine effort there to engage with his audience? Do you see him referencing other people's tweets? Uh, how often does he do that? Uh, so take a look, you know, and write up your impressions, maybe in a couple sentences, about 100 words or so. Okay, then, uh, moving on, then, uh, Martin gives us three points to ponder. I think each of these are definitely worth pondering. Uh, so her first point is that no longer do the broadcasters, advertisers, and the PR moguls control the news. In the digital age, you are the media. Well, I, I bet you probably at least agree with this top bit, especially with the print news. You know, I get I have a subscription to the St. Cloud Times, and, you know, it is kind of alarming sometimes how thin <laughs> those newspapers are getting. You, know, you kind of have a, you sort of feel like maybe I'm one of the last subscribers to this thing. Uh, you know, of course, I, I like newspapers. I love, uh, you know, I love reading those things. I like print. Uh, but the fact is, it is just on the way out. And it's pretty clear to see. Uh, and the same thing with television news. Uh, although I think a lot of the big stations now, they, they tend to stream a lot of stuff on YouTube to try to stay relevant that way. Uh, but it is a big concern. And there is a lot more emphasis, as we'll see in a minute, on uh, social media. People getting the news from places like Facebook and, and Twitter. Not so much reading the newspaper or uh, watching uh, CNN or what have you. Uh, so that seems to be a pretty big shift. And, you know, you could look at it in kind of doom and gloom perspective. But, you know, the point here, the point we're trying to do, uh, <laughs> make here, I think, is that this could be an exciting opportunity as well. Uh, she says, the foundation is mattering in the moments of people's lives. Yes. Uh, the more often you matter, the more often people will tune in. And then, of course, the question, how then do you matter? Uh, so I'm sure you are aware of this. There are certain people you follow. Uh, there are certain uh, articles you click on. And I, I don't even, maybe, maybe even Aristotle said something along these lines. You know, you only care about stuff that pertains to you. <laughs> it's one of the reasons why the, uh, the these TV commercials are so ineffective, right? They just send these things out hoping that they'll matter to somebody. Uh, but the fact is most of us, they're, it's irrelevant to us. We, we don't like that product or we're not the right audience for that. Uh, service so we just kind of tune out uh, whereas the social media gives us a little more control over that we're able to filter out some of that irrelevant information uh, of course the flip side is uh, you don't want to be filtered out or you don't want your potential audience to be filtering you out so you have to find a way to connect with them to demonstrate that you are relevant to their lives so I always encourage you with the, with the blogs we'll talk about is if you can keep it local uh, that already matters to some people's lives, right? If you're talking about St. Cloud or even Minnesota, and there's kind of a built-in 
uh, idea that, that that will be relevant if you live in Minnesota or you live in St. Cloud or you go to St. Cloud State uh, versus if you're just talking about schools in general or the, the U.S. You know, the bigger uh, the audience, the harder it is to convince somebody that this pertains to them. Instead of just being this uh, one-size-fits-all experience they were trying to get away from. Uh, the third item here, you matter by giving the audiences the audiences what they value, probably should say, uh, which is found when you use social media to listen and then continue the dialogue. So that, that's really the key. You're, you're trying to give the audience some valuable information. You want to matter to them. How do you figure out how to what that is? And then the technique is just simply to uh, kind of what we talked about in the last chapter with them, Martin, right? Asking the right questions, really listening to those responses, and then adapting uh, accordingly. Sounds easy, but is it? <laughs> <laughs> uh, so she talks a lot in here about Shaquille versus Shaq and how uh, they were working on Twitter, or he was. And one of the big goals there was to not come across as just, oh, it's a cheap gimmick, right? You follow him on Twitter, get a coupon for a, a, a shoe or whatever it is he sells. <laughs> uh, instead, they wanted him to come across as like, this is the genuine guy, right? This is This is the real dude. Uh, it's it's a humanizing of that connection. Uh, they want people to, uh, you know, they want to give people tweets information that they will enjoy, that they can relate to. And just looking at this tweet here, uh, I can see, for one thing, it's not written in what I would call formal, <laughs> you know, academic, or even like something you'd read in, a, in the New York Times or anything like that. It's very sort of down-to-earth style, very personable. There's a lot of uh, ac there's a lot of abbreviations here, um, sort of interesting things with uh, uh, symbols, <laughs> I guess. Uh, you could tell this this does this tweet doesn't come across as being like really serious and uh, corporate lingo. I mean, it just seems like a, a just a regular person, uh, not trying to talk over somebody's head or anything like that. It really seems down to earth to me. Uh, I'm not going to try to read this out loud. It'd probably just sound, <laughs> sound silly, but <laughs> I think it's a pretty funny post. Uh, so that we could ask ourselves, is this post, is this tweet, is it focused on the people that Shaq or Shaquille is trying to reach, or is it more focused on the products? So he does mention his uh, Shaq light there, but it's kind of just a minor, you know, I guess you could get offended by this or think, oh, he's talking about Shaq light product placement and, and tune out. Uh, but you probably wouldn't want to do that because you'd miss out on all this stuff about uh, the Phelps and the little jokes there. Uh, so I think it's done in kind of a subtle, funny way. It's probably a lot more effective than if it was just a, you know, a straight-up advertisement. Uh, so is it the Shaquille the Human or Shaq the Star? You know, I just I find all this fascinating just from a rhetorical perspective. You know, this this sort of star athlete. And then his effort to kind of transition to something else, basically to stay relevant uh, to the audience. And I think he's been really successful with this strategy. Uh, you can tell me your thoughts on it. Uh, but Martin's saying, you know, he, he seems like somebody people can relate to. We even see that with the style of these tweets. Uh, he was even someone people could see themselves hanging out with. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's always fun to see these political candidates try to emulate this. Uh, you know, they, they're basically they're about as alien in their daily experience, or you know, like a day in their life would seem so alien to us, we'd never never be able to uh, relate to any of it. It's just a completely different world uh, for them uh, than it is for us, basically. Uh, but. Nevertheless, they have to try to make it seem like they're just a regular person. They're just like you, even though they're absolutely not. <laughs> you know, even with the Shaq here, you know, I, I, I'm sure you would agree that he, uh, he's not doing, uh, you know, like I said, a day in his life would be unrecognizable uh, to any of us. But uh, some of these celebrities are better than others at at least seeming like they're authentic. Maybe I'm being a little bit cynical there, but, <laughs> you know, I think Shaq's really got a, got his, uh, I don't know whether, to what extent this is Martin's influence, but he definitely comes across more authentically than some of the other ones I have seen. Now, this thing with Oprah was a lot of fun. 
And again, this might have all been planned out. Basically, she tweeted out something in all caps, her first tweet ever. And then he responds to this, your caps are on, <laughs> by the way. Uh, so, you know, it's, it's a lot of fun. And I agree with her. You know, I'm not somebody that really follows uh, Shaq's career or knows a whole lot about uh, sports, but I think anybody would find this in music. So that's probably another one of the key strategies there. You know, I know this. I would say the same thing about people like George Foreman. You know, even people that weren't watching him during his uh, career, they're kind of into it. They see him on TV now. He's kind of become this uh, sort of funny guy that you know, always want to tune in and see, well, what's, you know, what's Foreman up to now, right? <laughs> uh, okay, so what is our rhetorical situation? Uh, you know, who are we trying? Who's out there? What's the audience? What we, what's our message? What's our purpose? Uh, what can what is an, what is up to persuasion? And she says, uh, Martin is saying here about the importance of building up a following. It's what most people want when they have a tweet, a Twitter feed, or a YouTube channel. And I worked, you know, I've seen a lot of brand new YouTubers, and usually this is the thing. It's like, well, nobody's watching my videos. You know, I got like twelve subscribers. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I got I got this Twitter post and nobody liked it, right? Or even on Facebook, sometimes I'll hear people say, "You know, I put a lot of effort into this into this Facebook post and nobody's liking it. You know, it's not getting any attention." And so, really, all of this stuff applies here. Uh, so, how do you do that? How do you build up this loyal, and then uh, probably more importantly to some of us, lucrative? <laughs> not just doing this for giggles, right? Uh, we want to make some money somehow. So how can we turn this? How can first? How can we build up this audience? How can how can we connect with them? Um, and then how can we help let you know? How can we let them define uh, what is newsworthy? Because again, a lot of this is about listening to them and responding, not just telling them, "Hey, audience, here's what I think you should be interested in." You know, it doesn't work that way. Uh, Shaquille is a master at this primarily because he's not so caught up in feeding his own ego, his own ego that he can't hear what others are saying. Well, I don't know if Martin is referencing a certain elephant in the room, as it were, uh, when it comes to Twitter. I don't know. <laughs> uh, but I think that is the key. And yet, you know, we'll talk about LeBron uh, James here in a second. But I think when you probably when you were looking at Shaq, and I know I did, I didn't really get the impression of this guy being this egomaniac or this feeling like of elitism or anything. You know, quite the opposite, actually. It felt kind of warm and fuzzy reading uh, Shaq. I had a good time. Uh, and then Martin compares uh, his approach to LeBron James. And if you read the book, uh, they talk in there about how basically this James did this bait and switch routine. Said, hey, follow me on Twitter, and then I'll tell you, give you stuff, give you uh, Twitter followers the first uh, news. You know, you'll be the first to hear the news, basically. Uh, but then decided not to do that and instead. Uh, do this special on ESPN, like a half hour long special. And I didn't watch this, but apparently it's just kind of the, the me show starring uh, me. <laughs> Not very personable. And it didn't really go over too well with him. She makes it sound like Shaq's approach was, was much better. So again, somebody who doesn't really follow s sports, uh, you'd probably know, if you do, you probably know more about that than I do, but it definitely seems like Martin is right. All right, then uh, moving on then to relevance. So she says, the truth is that social media is today's primary source of relevance, and you should be your own primetime channel. Uh, so I, I like this, you know, because it's not just about reporting. It's not just about getting information secondhand, but it's, it's really about uh, being that mover and shaker. All right, so here's another question for you. Uh, so what can you do to make your blog for this course matter to your, your audience? Now, how can you use Twitter and other tools uh, to listen to and deliver what your, what your audience values and to continue the dialogue? Remember, this is all about ongoing engagement. It's not a one-off thing. Uh, this you know, blog or Twitter feed even would be a regularly updated thing. So how can you approach these questions? All right, now we're into the uh, Carroll book again, and he's got some objectives here for us in this chapter, uh, which I, I really appreciate when an author does this. It makes my job a lot easier. 
Uh, but anyway, he says that by the end of this chapter, we should be able to, we should understand the fundamentals of digital media editing and the many roles of the editor. So I, I don't know about you. I thought that was really interesting. I'm not a journalist. I haven't ever done uh, worked for a newspaper or, or a, uh, my brother works for, or did work for a television news studio. And so I get a little bit of secondhand information, but still it's really interesting to see all those roles and to think about how they're changing. Uh, so that's the first thing. Uh, second one, be able to optimize content for search engines. You know, and this is the one a lot of people get fixated on, like how can I get the best page rank? How can I uh, optimize my keywords? And always sit, put that second to, well, you got to have the content. <laughs> you know, better to have great content first. And then uh, the keywords, uh, you, you could have the best keywords in the world, right? The best search engine optimizations or whatever but if, if your content's crappy it's just going to be you might get a few initial hits but it's not going to go anywhere uh, so it's kind of to me it's a lot of this is about putting the cart before the horse uh, so to speak uh, we can come back to that uh, third thing thinking strategically about how to expand your audiences All right there are I think I mentioned this before especially with these folks trying to make a freelancing career on with creative writing a lot of folks assume, well, I need to get on TikTok, I need to get on Instagram, I need to Pinterest, and they try to do like 50,000 things. And they're updating all this stuff and they're basically going insane. <laughs> and so I think it's a lot better to think strategically about this, uh, even at this point. Think which, are, which of those services do you think most of your target audience uses? You know, is your target audience more of a Twitter audience or are they more of a Pinterest or more of a TikTok audience, you know, whatever it is, you have to sort of go where they are, or they just won't see your, uh, they won't see your content. Uh, fourth, understanding the unique demands of freelance work. Yes, that's really what I like to uh, to focus on. So we'll try to get there as quickly as we can. All right, digital media, no time for slouching. Yes, don't believe the hype. Editing stuff online is still about correct grammar orthography which just means the spelling and style as well as ethics so this is something I hear all the time too and we saw those posts from Shaq a while ago and they weren't what I would call grammatically correct you know they weren't formal edited uh, English uh, it's just more of a more like it's not even really imitating a speech it's almost as kind of its own language <laughs> you know the Twitter style over uh, those uh, abbreviations and acronyms and things. But, you know, as soon as you are moving into writing a blog, uh, trying to write something that, you know, nobody would want to read uh, that style of uh, Shaq's tweets for more than a little <laughs> sentence or two. I mean, could you imagine reading a whole paragraph like that? You know, you'd quickly get, it'd quickly get off-putting. Uh, so that's a little bit of insight there. Uh, but I agree with the uh, Carol... You know, again, as soon as you get beyond just tweets and you want to have something more sustained, you will get right back to the, all the skills that you've been learning in an English class since uh, grade school, right? Nobody likes reading uh, poorly spelled, even tweets. You know, if there, there's a lot of obvious spelling errors. Uh, and I'd say there's a big difference to me between something intentional, like with the shack using you are for your. Uh, that doesn't strike me as a spelling error. Uh, if it was the wrong your, like Y-O-U apostrophe R-E instead of Y-O-U-R, something like that, that's more irksome. <laughs> you know, that really does seem like, well, the person just doesn't know what they're doing uh, or they made a mistake more than they're just trying to be cute or they're trying to blend in. Um, now, the ethics component here is uh, something important. So he, I, liked, I really like this sentence here. I wanted to type it out in full. So ethics is not just about or what most people think about ethics is uh, I guess legal concerns not doing something illegal uh, but I like going beyond that with my definition as Carol does here uh, so ethics is also about doing the small things well so small things treating colleagues well thinking about what it means to serve your interactors and the hundreds of decisions you might be called upon to make in a typical work day uh, so I, I love this you know it's about being polite not putting your own interests above, not just your audience, but your uh, your colleagues who might be working with you on this blog. 
And so it's, it's a really nice way to think about ethics, I think. Not just global ethics, uh, but, you know, just the way you treat your coworker. Uh, job responsibilities. Uh, so he gives this long set of uh, descriptions of what it was like, I guess, to work in one of these newspaper offices where there's all these different types of editors and everybody sort of has their uh, place on the org organization chart, right? With digital publishing, though, there is a lot of similarity, a lot of overlap, but uh, most of the time these what used to be discrete separate jobs <laughs> Remember when I was in a high school, my uh, best friend at the time, his mother was an editor at a newspaper. And I'll never forget, I was I thought this, I, I didn't know much about what she did, right? So I, one time I was talking to her, I was like, what is it, what do you do with the newspaper? What does that mean to be an editor? And she says, well, I'm not a, I forget what she says, I'm not a copy editor, I'm not a managing editor. Basically what she was, was a headline editor. And I was, it just kind of blew my mind. Like, so your whole job is just writing the headlines? <laughs> She's like, yes, that's a full-time job. It's a, actually a good job. You know, of course, that was back in, the, I guess, the 90s when there were still lots of uh, newspapers. Uh, so that just kind of blew my mind. There was that much specialization. Like, all she did was work on headlines. Uh, apparently not unusual. Uh, but you can think about there probably wouldn't be all these different levels on a blog, <laughs> you, know, you might be doing all of this stuff yourself, or at best you might have somebody managing the blog and everybody else doing whatever <clears throat> they can do to get this thing out. And I started a blog with some friends back in, yeah, what was that? It must have been the late 90s, or early 2000s. It's called Armchair Arcade, and we certainly did all this stuff ourselves. Back then we were trying to do these PDFs or or uh, online magazines, we called it. But yeah, well, nobody just did one thing, right? We were all kind of writing their articles, editing other articles, doing uh, our own headlines, putting, finding images. You know, we had to do it all. And we didn't really have this concept of the uh, discrete hats. Uh, editing about making decisions. Oh yeah, I like this line. So editing is making lots and lots of decisions as an advocate for readers. Hmm. Yes, I did notice that with I'm sure Arcade, sometimes we would solicit uh, articles from other people. And that was one of our jobs, right? Is, well, we've built this audience. We got people coming to our site, uh, talking to us, discussing with us that like our articles. Uh, this other person's coming in, wants to make a pitch, wants to post something. So we had to decide is this appropriate for our, our, our audience? Is it the right kind of style? Uh, it was a little bit disorienting sometimes because we get some my academic connections you know i'd have these ac academic colleagues come in want to do an article and then we would see that their style was you know we didn't want uh we were trying to hit like a certain style with armchair arcades so it would be intelligent but not this sort of dry academic you know prose with uh, references to as many obscure uh, critical theorists as you could put in there right it had to be what we'd call something like human readable so that was a problem uh, sometimes. But we would you know, put ourselves in the role. Well, what, as a reader of this, you know, what would we want to see? And they also talk in there about the what I call the TLDR problem, or too long, didn't read. <laughs> you know, a lot of the times, I, you know, as a professor, too, I just see this all the time. This uh, stuff is way, way, way longer uh, than it needs to be. You know, I, I tell my freshman classes all the time you know the problem is you when you're coming up you're given assignments like give me five pages on x topic so you write maybe one page on x topic and now you're out of stuff to say but instead of going out and finding more stuff to put in the paper you just try to pad that out <laughs> and you get pretty good at that uh, or you did you never are asked well cut this back it's like teachers, they, they just want to see more. Like five pages is better than two pages, even if those extra three pages are garbage. I said, there's a lot of that kind of problem. And once that's once those habits get ingrained, it can be really difficult. Probably a great challenge for a lot of people to step back, be able to step back and say, okay, now I need to get to where I'm writing concisely, 
I don't want, if, if I can say in two pages <laughs> what somebody else has to take five pages to say, uh, that's a great asset. You know, especially with so much content out there, there's only so many hours in the day. Uh, you're probably not going to sit down and read, you know, this 15 to 20 page article unless you have to, uh, right? Whereas something that's a little more manageable, a couple pages, you, you look at that and say, oh, I could read that right now. You know, you read that, uh, move on. You know, so it is something I want us to come back to throughout this book because I think Carol and I are in, in harmony on this idea. You know, better to be, I kind of put it this way, better to leave an audience feeling like, you know, I wish that article had been a little bit longer. You know, I like that better than, man, I didn't think that article was ever going to end. <laughs> uh, better to be, uh, leave them wanting more. Okay, so some strategies. Uh, so identify the audience and the purpose of the content, then serve that audience and that purpose. So this, again, just classical rhetorical stuff. You know, is this an audience of fans, casual fans? Are you talking to hardcore fans? Uh, and again, what is the purpose? Are you trying to market something? Are you trying to inform the audience? Are you Are trying to entertain the audience? And you really have to make some decisions. You know, it's not always, you could do a lot of different things, right? But uh, being clear about these things and just deciding, okay, it's going to be serious and it's going to be for professionals. You know, once you're able just to make that choice, everything else falls into place. And I find that if you're trying to go into this thinking, well, I just want the biggest audience possible, uh, or I don't want to appeal to just one demographic. I, you know, I want to appeal to everybody. You know, that seems to be the default setting, and it just doesn't work. You know, you're better off if you target a specific audience, because even when you target that one specific audience, you know, it's not like you're screening out other types of people. You know, if they if they like your content, they will come anyway. You know, I always think about the uh, all the cartoons. Or shows like uh, just finished watching uh, Batman, the 1966 classic Batman show, and they were talking in there about how it was made for kids, but a lot of adults like the show as well. You know, and you, you could probably think a lot of cartoons like that. Uh, so just having an audience, a target audience, doesn't mean you're going to automatically block other kinds of people. Uh, two, just determine a scalable, sensible structure. You know, this is important when you're thinking about your blog, too, right? How, how big do you want these posts to be? How often will people post? How often can you realistically go out and do the research? I was, um, one of my favorite podcasts is called Skeptoid. And this, it's uh, Brian Dunning does this, uh, just a, I don't know if he's got other people working for him. I think he's got a small crew of people to help him research his uh, podcast. But basically, once a week, he puts out a podcast, a Skeptoid episode, and it's about somewhere between 10 to 15 minutes. And he does a transcript uh, along with that. But, you know, you might look at that and think, man, that is not a lot. Just, you got all a week, and all you turn out, turn out is this little 10-minute podcast, you know? Uh, you could do a lot more than that. But really, that's probably, my guess is he's probably working a lot harder <laughs> than I do at my job just to be able to make that really solid 10 minutes. And no telling how much that needs to be edited and redone over and over again to get it nice and tight. And so you're listening to it, you just think, well, that sounds like it'd be easy to do. Uh, but then when you get into it yourself and you start really trying to get a good solid 10 minute episode, now that can end up taking all week, right? So that gives you some sense of the scale of this. You know, a lot of people start off saying, well, I'll do like an hour long podcast. And, you know, it's just unmanageable. You can't uh, do that. Uh, three, edit the content. Well, of course, right? We don't want first drafts going live on our sites ever. Uh, proofread and test usability. So those are a little slightly different skill sets. And we'll talk about proofreading in here, but usability has to do with things like interface. You know, if you can find, if I'm looking for an article, is it easy for me to figure out how to do that or do I have to search all over to try to find the search button? <laughs> Copy, edit some more. Write the headlines. Notice how that's kind of at the end of this, which is good. 
because a lot of times you won't really know what the article is about until you've written it, edited it, edited it, revised it, and finally got it into a good shape. And then that headline usually will present itself. If you try to write the headline first, that's fine. You know, that could be a good way to get started. But you might find it doesn't fit the content once you're done. And then testing usability is down there again. Because, uh, again, if they can't find the article, all the rest of it's a moot point. Okay, copy editing levels. And the idea here is that we do each of these separately. So remember, the copy editing, the article's written. It's in a rough draft state. Now you're going back through and trying to take it to that next level, make it professional, make it sleek. So you want to do these in separate steps, not try to copy edit everything all at once. And that's, I think, a really key insight. So a lot of people, when they copy edit or proofread, uh, they take it line by line, just keep going down like this. Uh, and they think about everything. Like, well, I'm going to be checking for spelling, I'm going to be checking for grammar, I'm going to be checking for focus. It's just too much. You can't really do it that way. Uh, so what you want to do is just break it into discrete steps and not worry about these this other stuff until you get to it. So the first wave, the sort of first pass, you're looking at organization, focus. You know, does it, your paragraphing make sense? Can you do that reverse outlining? Uh, does that make sense? Is each paragraph just about one thing? Uh, and a lot of times you'll find that you might talk about something down here and also talk about it over here. And maybe a little, you don't even mention it in your intro. So that's, this is the step here where you're like, okay, I need to move this up here, move that up there, make sure the intro fits, and so on. Uh, so that's the first pass. Second pass, accuracy. And I got an exercise coming up uh, along these lines. But yeah, it's really embarrassing when you have uh, not just grammar errors, but you know, factual errors uh, that people can point out. And it doesn't take very many of these. Uh, you know, a lot of people just delight in this. You know, I get this all the time. Make a <laughs> write a 300 page book you got one big error in there and it's like day one review that error is you know front and center of all the reviews you know it's terrible uh, so really being <laughs> making sure your information is accurate really st striving for that uh, third grammar spelling and orthography which also I'm not really quite sure what he means by orthography if I looked, looked it up it just said spelling system but I guess it could be everything uh, you know, he talks about style manuals in here. Uh, sometimes uh, these different companies, different newspapers will have different rules for things like uh, email. Is it E hyphen mail? Is it just one word? Is it capitalized? And so on. So that's not always universal. Uh, so maybe that's what he's getting at there. I'm not really sure. Uh, punctuation. You know, so commas and periods, usually the two big ones. You probably don't want to be using lots of uh, lots of semicolons and uh, double dashes and things. Uh, and then the style of the piece. So is it clear? You know, is it is it not too informal, not overly formal? And then finally, the pacing, rhythm, and the flow. So sometimes something it can be technically correct, it can be accurate, it can be well organized. But you know, when you're reading it out loud, it just doesn't sound good. It doesn't feel well <laughs> in the mouth. It's kind of. I think it's a good sign if you're reading something out loud. And it's difficult, or you're not getting enough breath. <laughs> you know, go back in, see if you can edit this, make it flow a little bit uh, more nicely. And here's our editing techniques. So read once through quickly. That's always good. You know, especially if it's some, if you get a somebody else's article that you're editing, right? So just first time, don't be stopping all the time to mark stuff. Just read it through quick. You know, see if you can get the gist of it. And then he talks about reading backwards. You know, so this is where you're breaking up that flow. Because uh, what happens when you read something from A to Z or from start to finish is your brain is basically supplying. You're not even actually, there's been studies on this. Uh, where your eye, you might think your eye is just kind of going like this, you know, from line to line, like that. Uh, when, when they do these uh, eye tracking movement, or when they track the eye movements of people reading, uh, they find it's just crazy. You know, and, and it's just bizarre. And so what happens is you see a word and like your imagination kicks in and like predicts like what's going to be around that word. So you only actually see like maybe 20% of the words on the page as you're reading. I mean, it's really mind blowing. It doesn't work at all. Reading is nothing like you think it is. <laughs> uh, so what you want to do to break that habit is if you read backwards, 
you know, starting here with like organization, evaluate to you know, work your way back, that prevents your brain from just jumping in and uh, trying to uh, speed read. You know, people say this like speed reading, like it's a great thing. Like, oh, I can read a novel in one day. You know, I'm a great speed reader. Uh, all that really is saying is that, the, you know, it's like bragging about eating a lot of fast food. <laughs> you know, I can eat, I can go to McDonald's and, you know, get eat lots and lots of french fries. It's not really a healthy way to read. You're missing most of the content. It's very little nutritional value in a speed read. Uh, you're much better off reading less and reading with a more focused, intentful, meaningful way. Uh, and especially when you're editing, you know, this is absolutely critical. There's no such thing as speed editing. <laughs> so you really have to slow down. And a lot of these strategies, by the way, are just ways to slow, make yourself slow down. Like printing it out on a hard copy, uh, I find this helps a lot sometimes just seeing it in a different format. Uh, reading it out loud is probably the best strategy, especially, you know, there's been some studies. If you're not a native speaker, sometimes this could actually get you into more trouble. You know, if you're not used to hearing uh, edited English read out loud, it's not going to be very helpful. Uh, but if, if you are, though, that can really help you to find things. Let's see, read to find holes in the story and to evaluate the organization. So kind of, again, backing out a little bit, looking at the bigger picture. I like this part about cutting it up and spreading it out. And I've done this too, what he talks about one of his professors would do, would literally just cut, chop up all the paragraphs, lay it out you know, all over the floor, and then just think about what could you cut out. If you cut something out and it still makes sense, generally better to cut it out. And I have the creative writing books. I love reading books about writing. You know, like how do you become a better writer you know, no matter what kind of writing it is and I have come across this more than once this idea of cut the intro uh, cut the first part <laughs> usually that just makes it better already boom it's better and see if you can make that you know after you chop off the first paragraph uh, maybe make that second paragraph your intro and do a little editing make that work uh, but the argument is, you know, as you're writing that first paragraph, you're kind of figuring out, like, where do you want to go with this paper? What am I doing? What's, what am I saying? There's a lot of making a lot of decisions. And by the time you get to that second or third paragraph, you, you get sort of in a groove. And you know this when you're writing. Uh, you write for a while. You don't, you're kind of stumbling around. Uh, but then suddenly you're like, you're in the, in the zone, right? And you're just putting out pages. And so the idea is just cut the stuff that you wrote before you got in the zone. And you can always get in there and tweak it, make it work. But a lot of the times that lo you lose a lot of baggage, really just slowing everything down. And you really don't want to be the, you don't want your start, you don't want your papers to, or articles to start off in a boring, uh, disorganized way. And that's be a sure turn off. And so, anyway, yeah, cutting it up, spreading it out. Uh, Scrivener is great for this. Uh, any tool that let you kind of just separate things out will be helpful. Uh, read it all again. Right, so it's always important, especially after you've done some big cuts. You know, you got to go back, make sure it still fits. You didn't cut anything out that was uh, critical. All right, so here's a little fact-checking exercise. So I got three of these. They shouldn't take you too long, but try to be careful. <laughs> That's the whole point. Uh, so I got a list of facts here uh, from the book. Uh, so as the copy editor of a news website, you need to confirm these facts. Be sure to write the answer, so whether it's fact or not, <laughs> whether it's true or not, I guess. Your source, so is this a CNN, CBS, Wikipedia, whatever. And then the URL for that source, which is the link. Uh, so the first one, your newspaper is doing a story on the registrar of the University of North Carolina at Wilmington. Find that person's name and confirm the name and its spelling. Corroborate by finding a second source verifying the information. And so for this one, you actually have two sources. Uh, second, you are doing a story celebrating the establishment of the First Amendment. What is the exact wording of that amendment? Uh, again, list your source, corroborate by finding a second source with the same exact wording. Uh, three, you are doing a story on a new airline servicing the International Airport in Atlanta. Uh, the airline will be based out of the international concourse of that airport. What is the proper name of the airport? Which of its concourses is the one devoted to international flights? Identify your source and corroborate. And so this is just like classic editing stuff. 
you know, if you're an academic, there would be one about uh, verifying quotations or citations. So there's people at every journal whose job it is. If you're quoting something, uh, they have to go find the original quotation, make sure you quoted it correctly and cited the cited it correctly. <laughs> That's probably about the most ter most terrible job there could ever be, <laughs> at least in my opinion. All right, making the story shorter. So again, very common if you take any kind of creative writing class or any journalism class, I guess, I'll say if you can cut it, cut it, right? We just need to cut these things down, but you don't want to cut valuable stuff, but you just have to cut the cut the filler, <laughs> not the stuff that needs to be there. Uh, so he says, Carol says, I just, you can't have one method. You need to do a combination of things. Uh, so he works on line editing, substituting short adjectives for longer phrases, and then even removing entire blocks. All right, and then we move into helping people find your work, which is what a lot of people start with when they should start with the other stuff. But anyway, so yeah, you've written the blog, you, know, you got your Twitter up, you got your YouTube video up. Uh, how can you direct people? How can you make sure people can find your story or your video? So this is the, I love the way that he puts this. So what might people, so it makes kind of puts it back on you, right? So what might people type into a search box, Google or what have you, to find the story for which you are writing a headline. So here we're trying to write a headline or we're trying to title our blog, title our video. So you think, I don't know what to put. So just imagine that, you know, I'm Googling, trying to find my video. Uh, what, what's gonna get me there? What's the right keywords? What's the right words to use? So it says, you know, come up with a phrase or some words, type them into Google, see what pops up. And I guess if uh, what pops up has nothing to do with your piece or is unrelated, then you want to try some more keywords and keep doing that until you get, get a list of things that seem relevant. And I like this bit too. This is pretty clever. So you can also glean keywords from what you find. So if I'm typing in things to find, uh, to try to get some keywords this way and I see some, I can, I can look at the titles of those articles popping up or those videos. And if I see the same ones a few times, I might write that down right that might be one of the keywords i should use as well and this can make a huge difference people totally underestimate that but when you're uploading like a youtube video you know if you really put some thought into the title and you supply some good keywords so people can find the material uh, it just takes it to the next level because most people that's the, that's the way they find your videos right they will go and i like the fact that if i go to youtube right now and type in rhetoric and composition if you, I think I'm like number five <laughs> the lectures for my 191 class. And it was just because of those keywords in the title. Uh, general tips for headlines and keywords. Uh, so this is when you are creating the title or the headline. Uh, one, to use uh, brevity, be brief, 10 words being ideal. Uh, be complete. So you need to have a full idea of what, what it is you're going to click on before you click on it. Uh, be clear. That's kind of self-explanatory, right? But what is this thing? I think all this applies to emails, by the way. <laughs> just throwing that out there. Uh, and then be proactive. We just said, you know, test out the keywords, type it into Google, uh, see if you get decent results. So very good. This is, these are very smart tips. Uh, so let's take a look at this. He's got his examples, but I went ahead and got some fresh ones here uh, for us. Uh, at least I hope they're... I don't know when you'll be watching this video, but <laughs> this is uh, January 20th, uh, 2020. This was on Google News. Uh, so the first one there is Richmond Gun Rally. Thousands of gun owners converge on Virginia Capitol on MLK Day. That's from NPR. Uh, the second one was from Politico. Uh, Trump's staffing struggle. Trump's staffing struggle. A little bit of, a, what do you call that, alliteration, I guess. After three years, unfilled jobs across the administration. And then the last one, two dead and shooting outside Kansas City nightclub. And that's actually pulled from the uh, Kansas, one of these Kansas City uh, websites or news, TV news, maybe, or radio. Oh, so there you go. You could ask, are these brief? Let's see how many words there are. One, two, three, four, 
Should we count this? <laughs> 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. So fairly close. You probably wouldn't. I don't know if you'd want to count the as one of the words, but that's pretty close to 10. Let's see about this one. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. That's only eight words. Let's look at the NPR one. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. Uh, I guess it'd probably be more like 10 if we took out these uh, prepositions. But, you know, NPR, I think they probably tend to be a little wordier. <laughs> uh, but these all seem, I think they all uh, fit the parameters, right? They're brief enough. They're complete. I, I know what the articles are about. Uh, they're, they're clear enough. And I don't know to what extent they tested these out. I assume they did. But I think this is kind of an interesting comparison. So this is uh, Drudge. So I did a search for top news websites, and Google News was on there. I think it was Google News, Drudge, and Facebook. So I wanted to see what this Drudge report looked like. So this is kind of curious to me. Maybe it kind of defies uh, some of the the learning, <laughs> some, of what, uh, some of what he was saying, Carol. Because really here, uh, the interesting thing about this is just a few, two or three words for these headlines. So instead of having like the the full thing, I guess this these editors on Drudge just take out a couple of words, uh, and it's all in caps. You know, it looks big and scary. <laughs> Showdown, Virginia, gun rally, tense, militia issues warning. You know, this almost sounds like a telegraph to me. It's very, it's almost too brief. But you know, then again, uh, they, well, I guess what they want is to have this picture here to communicate some of the. Uh, sort of visualize some of this so you don't have to read it uh, even though this it's kind of interesting that the text on this flag looks a lot like the, <laughs> the text below <laughs> anyway i'm getting kind of off topic there uh, but i don't know you know you could find stuff like this and it kind of throws you throws you i mean this is very brief you, you know you'd almost think too brief but yet that's a huge site it's right up there with the you know google news and uh all the rest of them. So they clearly are doing something right. So let's just compare these uh, briefly as a question. So which of these headlines do you think, don't worry about, I know some of these are kind of slanted politically. You know, just put that aside for the moment. Uh, we're not going to worry about that here. Uh, we just want to know, is it direct? Is it clear? Is it straightforward? Do you basically, do you know what you're going to get when you click the link? <laughs> uh, or is it confusing or too long or um, not clear or incomplete. So I'm not going to read all those to you, but you can see them there. So just think about all three of those and come back. Uh, then we get into improving SEO, which is search engine optimization. And again, something that people really get fixated on, they think the problem is, you know, if I just had better SEO, then my site would be doing fine. Uh, when really the problem might be the content's no good. You know, so I keep coming back to that. But, I mean, the content is crap. doesn't matter how good the SEO is. <laughs> You're just It's easier to get to crap, but uh, the only way to, uh, to sustain an audience is if you have stuff that people want to come back for. Uh, so you want a site where people feel like, oh, that was really good last time. They tell people about it, and then they come back uh, for more, and then you build up that loyal following. Uh, that's what you should be shooting for, uh, not this sort of splash campaign. Uh, but anyway, I think Carol would agree with me here. He puts it this way. Uh, improving SEO is more like planning out a city than putting out a fire. And it depends on great content consistently offered for a long time. So I absolutely agree with this. You know, I tell a lot of the, the folks, that, a lot of, I hear from folks that get on YouTube and they do a similar kind of stuff to what I'm doing and then, uh, they will uh, message me and be like, "What? How'd you get this following? Or what do I need to do?" And I look and I see, "Well, you got like two videos. <laughs> uh, you just haven't. I've been doing this for long enough. Uh, just don't even worry about. I wouldn't even say don't even worry about all the search engine optimization stuff right off. You know, you need to be more worried about developing those skills as a writer or video editor first. And then, uh, for me, I never really focused on just let me go out and build up this audience." You know, eventually people will find the content if you if you're known for putting out regular content that's good quality. You know, they'll tell people, and those people will tell people, and eventually you'll have what you want. 
Uh, that's a pretty good strategy, in my opinion. But that said, if you, people can't find it, you know, obviously that is a problem. All right, what about the length of blog posts? Or the length of anything, really? And Carol hits at this number, 300 words. That seems to be about the magic number for Google. Uh, so if it's shorter than that, Google will ignore it. And then if it's longer, it tends to get shared more often. So I, I was thinking about this, the psychology of this. So I do notice this sometimes, where if I see, if I'm on Facebook and somebody's posted a link to an article or Twitter or something and I click on it, and it tends to be like a, if it's like a 15 or 20 page thing, it seems like kind of a big deal, like that uh, should be shared. Uh, where, if, again, if it is something really short, you might just kind of like it and then move on. So it is an interesting take on this. Uh, but I do agree, this is why I make all the, if you're posting a nugget or something, I always say 300 words is, a, I want you to kind of get in the habit, get a feel, get a really good feel for what 300 words feels like, uh, so that you, ha you don't have to keep looking it up in the word counter. But eventually you get to where you can get a pretty good sense of, you know, where the 300 words are. Uh, and that seems to be the sweet spot for a lot of this stuff. And then it gives us the site Boing Boing that seems to break all the rules. Uh, here we just kind of, they're pulling from a lot of different sites. And he talks about this sometimes, these companies that will just get some headlines for you, relevant uh, headlines for your website. You can just get a plug in, pop, pop them in. Uh, but he says really Boing Boing's key is that all their links, there's, there's always something interesting, there's always something, you know, they know their audience really well. Uh, so, you know, looking at this, I'm kind of curious about all of these, especially this one. <laughs> you, know, see, you know, I see a, a robot with Thomas there, and I want to, what is it, Thomas the toy uh, train, I think? Steam train, I forget. But anyway, you know, the picture is kind of cool. You want to click on it, you read the headlines, got robots, I mean, come on. And then over here, we got the, the sword and the stone. Uh, so there's, you know, generally something on Boing Boing for you, kind of political uh, co content there as well. Uh, but always something there that keeps you coming back. And, you know, just for fun, I, I was, uh, I've actually been on Boing Boing. <laughs> As you can see here, I was impressed that he mentioned Boing Boing. Uh, but I think it's interesting. When was this? I wrote this. I don't think it recorded the date. I was back in 2006. Uh, so they had a thing on the website where they said, if you got some news, just click the link and tell us what's going on, and they might post it. And so Mark Fraunfelder, you know, as you can see, he just took what I wrote and just put it right into the post. So I guess that's kind of flattering. I should feel complimented that they didn't feel the need to uh, edit my post. But if you look at what I wrote here, you say, I'm writing to let you know about an article I wrote this weekend that I thought the readers might find interesting. And it's the fir first part of a planned three-part series exploring the origin of the CRPG. And I tell them what that means. Uh, this part begins with a description of tabletop D&D, &D, a little bit about the article, what's in there, why they should care, what makes it good, what makes it a good read, and then throw out a bunch of game titles. You know, I guess uh, Mark liked it, so they put this they put this out, and it did indeed just, I mean, the, the views on this just went through the roof because of this boing boing thing. I want to say like uh, 50, 60,000 something people clicked that link. <laughs> to read this article <laughs> and it, the funny the funny thing was is just kind of on a whim I went to this boing boing site because I was you know I read it a lot but I never really thought about trying to suggest an article for them but it's kind of on the spur of the moment I said you know why not what have I got to lose you know and clicked on that and put in the uh, you know sent this in probably took me five minutes to write that and boom so you just never know when a, uh, something like that could happen uh, that said, don't try to intentionally game the system. You know, you, you talk to people all the time. They've got some kind of way to manipulate things. You're like, well, if you just do these keywords every time, or uh, if you, there's a thing on YouTube, they call it sub for sub. And they say, well, I'll subscribe to you, you subscribe to me, and then we'll get higher up in the ranks. Or, or just, you might think, well, let me just click on my own blog a hundred times. Uh, there's sites you can go to to pay uh, for bots, you know, to pay people somewhere to continuously click on things so it looks like it's coming from different URLs. So it's all these different schemes, and you sh you should just not stay clear, steer clear of that. 
you know, it might work for a little while for somebody, but sooner or later they're going to get in trouble. You know, matter of fact, that skeptoid guy I was telling you about, Brian Dunning, uh, he actually went to prison for that. He was, I forget the details, but it was something about an eBay referral thing. And he, he wasn't the one to come up with it. You know, somebody suggested some kind of tactic so he could get this eBay reference out in more places and get more money. Uh, a lot of other people were doing it. He was just one of many, you know, that was trying this uh, technique. And, uh, but, you know, that, nevertheless, he was the one that ended up going to prison uh, over that. So, uh, you know, I, I, <laughs> that's not enough to scare you away from it. Uh, I don't know what will, but... Yeah, the simplest advice is just to stick to the basics, conspicuously conspicuously avoid attempting to game Google's or any other search engines, algorithms. Uh, so chances are, if you're hearing about this exploit, you know, somebody's like, yeah, try this, and you'll get a higher page rank. Chances are, by the time you're hearing that, Google knows about it, and you're just going to get yourself into trouble. Uh, so I would just, you know, if just focus on making the good content, and a lot of this other stuff will fall into place. All right, multimedia storytelling. So we want to allow the story to drive the media choices rather than the medium determining the kinds of stories that are pursued and produced. So this is a concept we've talked about before. And he puts it in the context of news, which was kind of interesting. Like, do you need a film crew down there to film this? Is it something that could just be handled in text? Would it be better to have recordings? And then once we bring in multimedia, then we find we have all sorts of different techniques we can use. Uh, so here's an example I, I thought was a really good example. He's talking about these Paris attacks happened a few years ago and sort of how they combined all of these different tools. So they had Twitter feeds of the breaking news and updates of what the police were discovering. It's kind of on the spot, person on the street reporting. Uh, then they had interactive maps of the path of destruction showing the location of the attacks. And so that's another facet. Uh, they had the video. They had the podcast. They had photo slideshows. You, know, you don't always want to watch a video, right? Sometimes you just want to scroll through the photos. Uh, links out to resources uh, such as transit system information. A narrative with sidebars guiding readers through the major developments and fact-checking revising earlier reports. So you can see quite a bit going on uh, there in this coverage. Now, so there's something for you to check out. It was mentioned a few times by Carol. So this is the Atlantic Slave Trade in Two Minutes. Uh, so I don't want to show it here. Just I want you to click the link, check it out, you know, see how it works and everything. And then uh, once you kind of uh, absorb that, come back and think about big data. So all the data they use to collect this and present this information. What do you think about this map? Is it interesting, innovative? Is it enlightening? Maybe you can think of some other, other subjects you could cover in a similar fashion. <coughs> all right. Uh, so just a few last things here. Uh, the content management systems, or the CMS, uh, he talks about those just being a way to post content. So you can just focus on writing an article without having to worry about HTML tags or CSS or cascading style sheets, much less JavaScript. So before these things existed like WordPress, if you want to have a website and you wanted to have like a commenting tool, you pretty much had to write that code yourself to let people log in, make a comment. It was just a lot of trouble. <coughs> uh, that's why all these systems exist uh, that do all that sort of stuff for you. And nevertheless, if you do know some HTML, some CSS, you can do a lot of cool stuff uh, that other folks won't be able to do. That's a lot of times if some people, you know, well, you have to work with this template. But, you know, if you know a little bit of, of this other stuff, you can do cool things with that template, right? Or you can have it be more interactive. Or you can make it just the way you want it. And not even though the, uh, by default, is giving you this other option. So we'll talk more about that over the course of the semester. Uh, so what do uh, does a digital writer and editor need to know? Uh, one, how to capitalize on the new rhetorical capabilities of digital in terms of presentation. And so knowing things like how to when it would be appropriate to bring in a Google map and how would you go about that? Uh, when would it, how do you bring in, uh, how do you syndicate things from other sites? 
you know, all that sort of stuff. How do you make a how do you make a poll? How do you do a survey? How do you incorporate a video? It, on and on. Uh, two to monetize those presentations to pay at least some of the bills. So most people, you do run into people all the time that say, I'm just doing this for fun. It's just a hobby. I don't want to make any money. I don't care about money. And really, unfortunately, they tend to be part of the problem, right? They're getting people used to this idea of just getting content for free without having to pay. <laughs> and you see the websites now, they're struggling with these uh, ad blockers. So I know I happen to know a guy, John Birnbaum, Jim Birnbaum. Is it Jim? Anyway, Birnbaum. He does game banshee out of the Twin Cities, and you know we talked. I've talked to him several times about this, about these ad blockers. He says they are stealing content. Uh, you know they're there. They're using the ad blocker. I'm not getting any money. Uh, they're still getting the, the stuff that you know I worked hard to write, post, present all this. I said it's really kind of unethical. He, he makes a pretty good case that it's unethical to use an ad blocker. Uh, that if you don't want to look at the ad, you just shouldn't go to the site. You should not use that. Yeah. Okay, uh, you know I see where he's coming from. I don't know to what extent we can uh, force people. <laughs> I mean, somebody is going to just create another ad blocker. Uh, so, so basically, good luck with that. But, but you know, are there other strategies? You know, are there other ways to get paid? We talked about Patreon already. Uh, we talked about sponsorships, promotions. You know, there's, there's different ways to make money. In uh, a lot of the success like Kindle and things of that sort, uh, one of their, one of the reasons they are successful is they make it harder for people just to copy and paste and basically pirate your stuff. Uh, let's see, to choose the media most appropriate for the story and then to effectively utilize those media, right? So you're saying, okay, I want to make a video. This, it makes sense for this to be a video. Okay, what do I do with the video? Where do I put it? Uh, how do I make it a good video? You know, how do I really leverage everything that YouTube has to offer as opposed to Vimeo? Uh, Vimeo is a different site. <coughs> yes, it's videos, but it's, it's very different <laughs> in terms of audience, in terms of what it will let you do, the stuff you could post. Uh, let's see, fourth, to work with others as a team and to share their work as a whole and not as separate or disparate pieces. Yes, that, I don't know if you can see this, I should probably move my thing around a little bit. <laughs> Whoops. <laughs> Let's see, there we go. I uh, work with others as a team and not to share their work as a whole, not a separate or disparate. Woo, it's kind of fun. Wee. All right. Uh, yeah, so this would be a problem for you if you have a blog and you want to have three or four other people on your team. You don't want them just doing their own thing, not fitting the style, not fitting the parameters, just everybody being independent. Uh, instead, you really need people to have this, you know, yes, they're individuals. But you, you also want to have an identity, shared identity as a team, uh, which can be really difficult. And I play a lot of uh, Dungeons and Dragons lately. And believe it or not, that comes up in there. As that kind of thing comes up a lot, too. You, know, you got somebody who's really creative, really clever, really funny. <clears throat> but they're not really, they kind of always just want to go off and do their own thing. They're not really thinking in terms of the group, you know, and, and, go, and <laughs> being part of a team. <laughs> uh uh, freelancing. All right, we're really going to have to finish this up before my, my voice goes. Uh, you know, that's the funny thing about this book. Like, he talks all, he talks a great game about being brief and being well-organized, but his chapters just go on for freaking ever. Like, good God, man. Uh, you know, put he's like uh, to break these chapters up in about three chapters each. <laughs> just my opinion, I would tell, I would, I would uh, dare tell this man uh, please break up your chapters into multiple chapters to make it a little easier uh, to process it all. But anyway, <laughs> uh, freelancing. Yes, yeah, a punishing business for all but an elite few. Uh, so maybe more so, less so now. You do have these other options out there. We talked about Kindle Reader and all this stuff. But still, it is hard to make a living uh, as a freelancer. Uh, I know people that do. That I know people kind of like me, but they're not a professor. You know, they just do this stuff full time. Uh, very smart, very capable, great writers. You know, it's not like they're just weren't didn't have what it took to get the degree. That's just not what they pursued. Uh, but they do. They really struggle. It is a full time job. You know, they're always out there trying to get people to mention them on their YouTube channels, trying to get on places like Boing Boing, 
uh, just to get the notice, you know, much less making the living. And you're not going to make a lot just from one or two articles here and there, right? You really have to get always be working on the next uh, two or three things and have uh, stuff in the pipeline. And so it's far from being this leisurely <laughs> activity. <laughs> of course, if you do make it big, uh, then you're set, you know, then you are your own boss, set your own hours, etc. cetera. Uh, but you probably won't get there easily. <clears throat> yes, and academic degrees don't matter all that much. Nobody's really, nobody's going to read an article just because it was written by somebody who has a doctorate. Uh, it might give you a little bit of extra, you know, kick. You know, they might say, well, this guy is a, you know, every now and then I do get somebody that will go on about, well, this YouTuber, Matt Burton, he's a professor. <laughs> you know, as if that adds some value to it. Uh, maybe for some people it does, uh, but a lot of people just, they don't care. They just want to see if it's a good video or not. And then they talked about pitches, and I've done this before. You know, I've published lots of uh, paid articles on places like Gama Sutra, uh, Game Set Watch. I've done some unpaid stuff just to get free games and things when I was just starting out. Uh, but this would always be part of the process. You know, if you want to write an article for some place like Gama Sutra, which is the probably still is one of the big game developer websites, uh, you know, they want you can't just say, "Hey, I'm Matt. I want to write an article." You know, they, and they have a process they want you to go through. And this is really good advice. You know, this is, the same would be true for magazines or whatever. Uh, you know, or if you want to write for Wired, online or off. You know, first you want to make sure you're really familiar with that venue. So what is Wired? Uh, what kind of style are the articles written in? Uh, who is their audience? You know, what kind of content do they normally publish? Uh, so that's a really key thing. Same thing with academics and journals, right? There's a difference between computers and composition, uh, which covers uh, computers and composition. And Kairos, at first they seem similar, uh, but then when you get into Kairos, you find that they really privilege um, interactive stuff and online uh, articles. They really want you to use the multimedia stuff when you write articles for them. Uh, whereas computers and composition, even if it's the online version, they're okay with just text. Uh, introduce yourself briefly. Uh, autobiographies and breathless listings of academic honors are door closers. So that's true. Unfortunately, I have noticed this even with a lot of uh, a lot of creative writers. You know, they're trying to do these these pitches and get on things, and they think, "Well, I'll just rattle off this massive list of all these prizes I've won." And nobody even. I mean, everybody's got like this. <laughs> And you know, we did these uh, interviews recently, and it just seemed like every person that applied for the job had like 300 of these little awards and prizes. And after a while, it just got kind of mind-numbing. Um, it didn't really have a, a good impact. Uh, so probably it is, uh, I would probably go with, with uh, uh, Carol on this short and sweet. <laughs> you know, a few big, major accomplishments is uh, more impressive than this long, tedious list of like <laughs> everything back to the second grade. Uh, all right, the pitch. So once you pass that, you know, here's, I'm Matt Barton, uh, I'm producer of this, and won, won that award, whatever. Uh, so from now, what's my story about? And I should be able to say that in a couple sentences, if not, <laughs> you know, go back to page one of the book. Uh, Two, why is this a good story? You know, we might actually think about that article I wrote for Boing Boing, where they just kind of, basically I was doing this stuff. I told them what the story was about, what made it a good story, uh, why is it a good story to run now. I guess I didn't really get into that. <laughs> a little different, I guess, with the history piece, because it's kind of timeless. Uh, but if it was something that was dependent on being done quickly, you know, we need to run this story while the game is hot. If we wait too long, nobody's going to care. Uh, four, why should the publication's audience be interested in it? So I think I actually started with this, right? Why? Here's something I think Boing Boing's audience would be interested in. Here's why. Uh, and then the contact info. So that's kind of key. Like, how can they get in touch with you? Now, as far as the kind of money you can make with this, yes, uh, Carol says the rates are just all over the place. Just almost random. I want to say those Gama Sutra articles... Uh, I don't know if it's even legal for me to say how much they were paying, but you know, if I, I, I'll give you a ballpark figure, a few hundred bucks, basically. Uh, pretty long article, 
takes takes probably took me at least a day or two to write, um, sometimes even a week. So a couple hundred bucks for that. You know, you're probably not going to be quitting your day job anytime soon uh, with that kind of income. Of course, you write for the bigger. Once you write a few of those and you get a pretty good reputation going up, maybe do some editing work. Uh, but yeah, you're probably not going to be quitting the day job anytime soon. Uh, or if you do, this would be a full-time gig, and you're going to be writing lots of articles for lots of places all the time. Uh, so you're going to have to be very well organized. Yeah, and the exposure doesn't pay the bills <laughs> or send the kids to college. So I ran into this. I have some friends that do uh, art and their, or music, you know, and they're always being told, well, you know, I want to use your music in my game or I want to use your artwork in this article. I don't want to pay you, uh, but I will tell everybody where I got the art from and post a link so you get the exposure. <laughs> uh, but they say that doesn't really pan out. You know, and I've done all the stuff. You know, I've been in, uh, like the Boing Boing thing, that was, uh, that paid off probably better than anything else, like in terms of, yeah, I did that for free. I just took my own time to send that blurb in, but that paid off. You know, I've done other things where I've been on, uh, I've done lots of radio interviews. I've been in other magazines. I've been on all these podcasts, other YouTube channels, uh, you name it, and really didn't get a hit at all. I mean, didn't really make any difference. Didn't help me sell any books. Uh, just made no impact. Uh, so again, it was something you'd think about. You know, even Harlan Ellison, really famous science fiction writer, author, you know, he was big on this. He would charge people to do interviews with him, which is kind of unheard of. Like you don't charge news, you don't charge newspapers or magazines to do an interview with you. You do it for the exposure. Uh, but his argument was kind of like mine. Well. You know, I'm going to sell the same number of books whether I go out and do 100 interviews or zero. It's not going to really make any difference. I'm really helping you out more than you're helping me. <laughs> a little cocky, but, you know, that's Harlan Ellison for you. But, you know, he, he kind of was on to something in a way. All right, let's end it here. Thanks for watching this. Again, apologies for these long chapters. You can always uh, take breaks as you need to, of course. Uh, but please do ask a question and leave a comment, and I will see you next time.